So, Jonathan, how did you decide to go to UCLA for college? Um, basically, you know, um, came out of UCLA in Florida. I knew I didn't want to go to school. It wasn't great football in the immediate Washington, D.C. vicinity. Every place is basically a plane ride, I told myself. So I kind of gave myself the whole country to look at and got out to UCLA and, you know, the combination that they had. It wasn't just the football. Was, the football was okay, but I went to better football schools. I mean, Florida was, you know, Steve Spurry and all that, but the combination of Los Angeles and the weather and track and field and just the environment, the way I felt out there, just seemed right for me. So Was it hard to turn down Steve Spurrier and Florida? Because, again, they were everything in the it, 90s. It was hard. I mean, Steve Spurrier was very compelling. He was a good – he sold me really hard in Florida. And they also had two guys coming in, Jason Odom and Reggie Green, uh, had already signed to play there, two true freshmen coming in. I was like, you know what, not that I didn't think I could – didn't think – not about com- competition. I just felt like, you know what, there are other places I can go because UCLA had a guy named Craig Nowitzki who was like sophomore All-American going to his junior year at left tackle. But, you know, I was like, it doesn't really matter. Was it important that you were able to compete in track and field and football? Yeah, very much so. I told every school I took a trip to, I said, I'm going to do track and field if I come to your school. If that's okay with you, then, you know, I want you to sign something saying so. And, uh, once I become first or second string, I didn't. I didn't. I, want, I knew I was doing a football scholarship, so I said I'm going to prove myself in the football field. Once I've done that, I want to do track and field in the spring. And everybody said it was fine. Terry Donahue was obviously a okay with it, and uh, they all say, you know what, it helped me out. You know, the the workouts, competition year round, the, the lifting was really kind of trans, translated well in football. Okay, no temptation for to play basketball at UCLA. You know what, I did play a little bit, like. In the spring with the guys, you know, in the men's gym, we'd all, you know, play some pickup games. And I, I held my own with those guys. It's funny, like my, uh, I guess it's my junior year, the year we won the national championship, I was messing around with the guys, and the, um, the athletic trainer was watching for the basketball team. He just kept telling me, he said, man, Jay, out, man, go. you got to come out, man. You should come out. So, you know, Jim Herrick was like, come on, man. You can come out and make the team, set some, help us practice, you know, set some picks, grab some rebounds. Because they seen me. I was like, that's pretty good. I was like, no, nah, I'm doing indoor track. I'm doing a shot. They win the title that year. I was like, it is what it is. What was it like playing in a Rose Bowl at UCLA? It was great. I mean, it's, it's strange because it's your home stadium already. But at the same time, you know what the game represents and what it means to play in the Rose Bowl. Um, so it was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, you know, everything about Pasadena was nice. I mean, I, I love that as my home stadium. I mean, even had I never played in an actual Rose Bowl game, just getting the chance to play there as my home stadium was great. Did you know you were going to get drafted in the NFL? Yeah, I do. Did, did you have any idea the Ravens were going to take you? Um, not really. Everyone, all the, the draft gurus were saying... Want to draft me? Um, no, because all the Mel Kuypers of the world were saying that Arizona Cardinals were third pick. Arizona Cardinals. My agent the night before the draft talked to the Cardinals. Sounds pretty good. Of course, Arizona Cardinals come up on the clock and they pick Simeon Rice. And I was like, okay. But I actually I took a visit to Baltimore because the Jets had the first pick, so I went to see the Jets. And I was on the East Coast, and I'm from DC, so I decided to come check out Baltimore because I can also see some family. And they asked me to come. So I knew a little bit about it, but not a lot, though. I mean, there was nothing really to know about Baltimore, so. Yeah, it was an expansion franchise. Yeah, exactly. You know, we get those white helmets, you know, day one with no logo, no nothing. And, you know, we're like, what is this? But, you know, we just we said we're going to make it work, so. You had a pretty big supporter in John Unitas. Again, he took liking to the Ravens. He said, the Colts are no longer my team. It's the Ravens. That's right, man. I mean, hey, the Colts. I've been stolen out of Baltimore by her, say. I mean, in the middle of the night, you know, we brought a team of fresh new approach. You know, we weren't going to bring the, obviously couldn't bring the Colts back, weren't going to bring the Browns down there. That, let's, let's make a whole new franchise. Let's rebrand it. Art left everything up here in the, in the Cleveland area. And he said, we're going to leave all your records, everything there. We're not going to do like the Colts did to Baltimore. We're just going to start our own new thing. What was it like playing there as a rookie for an expansion franchise? It was interesting. I mean, Uh, playing for France, you know, it was, it's all I really knew, you know. I mean, it was weird because everybody was new to the city. 
You know, nobody knew anything about Baltimore, so he couldn't go to a veteran and say, do you know anything about where to buy a house or any good restaurants? I mean, you, everyone was kind of discovering it at the same time. But it was fun also because the city was getting to know us, too. So there were no records to live up to, so to speak. We kind of created our own path. So that was kind of interesting and fun. When Brian Villa came to you, he was known as an offensive guru. Yeah. How excited were you guys to have that, him as a coach? We were very excited. You know, we needed a change. Ted Marchabrota was good for the first three years, but, I mean, uh, it was tough. It was a little outdated the way we did things. And, uh, you know, and, and Ted was an old school guy. I mean, that's what it was. Brian brought a, a fresh new approach, and it really kind of resonated with a lot of the guys, uh, especially early in our career. So, uh it was definitely a breath of fresh air. I mean, I wish we could have been a little better on offense, throwing the ball in particular. But, you know, what? I give Brian credit. You know, he worked with what we had, and he tried to get the best out of our team. Because he was a passing guy with the Vikings. Oh. He comes to you guys, and all of a sudden you're a running team. Well, you know, like I got him. You got Randall Cunningham playing great, and, you know, throwing to Jake Reed and Randy Moss and Chris Carter. It makes it a lot easier than Stoney Case throwing to, <laughs> you know, Justin Armour. And uh, it was all, too many guys to name. So, I mean, it just, you know, you got Jamal Lewis running the ball. You know, you say, you know, any mini um, Jamal Lewis. Did you enjoy pass blocking or run blocking more? Run blocking was definitely more fun. I think all offense linemen like to hit people. I didn't get in the game to get dictated to. Pat, but pass blocking, I always liking it to playing defensive basketball. You know, you got to protect the rim. You got to protect your quarterback. You move your feet, stay in front of him. And, I, I, you know, I just, I was very good at it. And I took it as a challenge to just not let that guy get there. Who was your toughest uh, guy to go up against? I'd probably say uh, the best guy I went against, I played him one time, Derek Thomas, was just a really incredibly versatile pass rusher. I mean, he could go power, he could go speed, change the direction, flexible, you know, the plastic man bendy stuff to where, you know, you can't believe he didn't go down. I mean, he was doing all that stuff. I'd probably say the guy who was the, the sneakiest, especially if you got him on the road, was the white Freeman. Let me change shirts. I'll be right back now. Okay. Uh, Dwight Freeney, man, he was, that little spin move of his is no joke. And his uh, first step was, you know, very, very impressive, especially on that turf in Indianapolis, all, all that noise. But I always said, you know, though, when I was on top of my game, I didn't really care who I was playing against because I felt like I could dominate anybody if I was on my game. But those were some of the guys when I knew I better be on top of my game, though. What was it like to play in that Super Bowl? Oh, it was great, man. You know, you, I never played a championship at any level, you know, high school, college. And to actually make it to that Super Bowl and to win it, you know, after the game, you're like, what's next? There's nothing next. We're, we're the champions of the world. It's just one of those feelings that's like, I did it. I, I accomplished it. And I don't really get a chance to say that about something that impressive very often. So that was really cool. How did you feel when you found out you were going in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Oh, I was, you know, after I play, you know, through those five years waiting, everyone's always telling you you're going to be a first round guy. Oh, yeah, you sure? You're sure. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. We'll wait and see. So when I got to find the call, it was more like relief, you know, like, yes, they were right. But at the same time, you know, obviously I was just overwhelmed, you know, ecstatic, just every adjective you can think of. I mean, just couldn't believe it. And it's just the humbling, especially when you get here and – you go through the hall and you go through the orientation and you get the gold jacket. It's just one of those things where, you know, you're part of. When I went in, I think there were 280 guys, 318 now. I mean, the history of the game, I mean, that's impressive. Now you're the tallest Hall of Famer. You overtook Doug Atkins and Bob Sinclair. That's right. See, I mean, and that, that means I was a knee bender. It's hard to play football <laughs> tall. It's not a tall man's game. So I pride myself on being able to really bend my knees when I was out there playing. And you're one of the youngest guys, too. Yeah, I'm, that's definitely another thing. You know, played 12 good years, and, you know, five years after I went in, I mean, uh, I was under 40 or 39 when I went in, and that was uh, really cool. I mean, not a lot of guys get to go in at that age, so... Yeah, that, that means I really did some good things out there. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, you're welcome.